this then. So I, I had to do some modifications with uh, Megana coming in a little bit late, uh, but you know, we can, we can keep this casual too. If you guys have questions along the way, um, go ahead and ask me. I think we have some time to fill here and I can go into a little bit more detail um, than maybe I, norm that I was going to originally. Um, I titled this presentation, Throw Away Electrodes for Microbial Fuel Cells. Um, and it's kind of a funny title, but I wanted to kind of inspire people about this technology um, and, and really focus on the, you know, kind of the benefits of technology and, and uh, the future growth and how that can solve a lot of our problems. And so I stole this uh, throwaway electrodes from a guy, um, Dr. Moore, many of you um, maybe know of him, he's the, the namesake of Moore's Law. And when he was helping to develop the transistor and microprocessors back in the day, he envisioned, at the time we had you know, big supercomputers, uh, or, you know, large computers, and it seemed like the challenges were very great for that technology to ever you know, scale down to where people would use it on a regular basis. But he envisioned a future where these um, capacitors would become so cheap that they would be in every device and everywhere all over the place that we would just throw them away. And sure enough, you know, we have computers in our pockets and we have computer chips and you know, kids' toys and, and sure enough, they do get thrown away. So I, you know, I consider myself somewhat of a techno-optimist. I think through technology and folks like yourselves that we will develop uh, you know, technologies to address some of the major challenges we have. Um, and and, and biochar and microbial fuel cells are, are one of those technologies that are gonna continue to grow and become to a price point where we're gonna see it adopted um, much more readily. So what, what I'll do here is I'll go through a little bit about what is a microbial fuel cell. Uh, does anybody familiar here? How many of you are familiar with a mic what a microbial fuel cell is? So a couple of you guys, okay, okay, a few of you, all right. So I'll get into what it is, um, what it can be used for, um, What's the catch with it, right? Uh, what, what's the limitations to this technology? And then what are, what are some of the solutions that I've helped develop with uh, Josh here, uh, one of my colleagues who gave a great talk yesterday. Uh, he helped me develop some of these um, solutions. And then I threw in this last little bit of this field application and use. Uh, and I gotta warn you right off the bat, don't tell my advisor. I, I threw this, it's unpublished. I threw it in here at the end. Of, uh, but I think you guys will be interested in it. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Okay, so this is a, a basic diagram of microbial fuel cell. I think it's a very um, basic uh, cartoon of, of how it works. And it's, it's similar to what, how a battery functions. You have your anode and your cathode. It can be separated um, by, a, uh, by a membrane. And what, we, what goes on in this process is you have this exoelectrogenic biofilm. Um, let me see, where's the, okay, the little laser here. So here's, this biofilm will grow on the, on the anode here. And these are very unique microbes that are, have, are able to break down really any organic matter um, that you can put in there, very hardy um, bacterial species. And as they break down this organic matter, they use the anode as an electron acceptor. So they have the ability to transfer these electrons extracellularly to the anode. And if you, put, if you create a potential gradient, just like any other battery over at the cathode, usually in, a, in, a, in an aerobic environment where the, the anode is in an anaerobic environment, you'll create a, a current. So the, the electrons will actually flow to the cathode um, and be accepted by a variety of um, electron acceptors and, and then we create an electrical current in the process. So a little bit about the bacteria. Um, there's a whole world of research being done on these kind of unique guys. They actually started from a professor here at U, um, well he's one of the founding like, researchers on it uh, for metal reduction. So that's kind of the, their role in nature is to reduce metals. And they can, they can do this direct electron transfer, so they have these really cool nanowires, they call them, that connect right to the electrode, and they can directly transfer these um, electrons to an electrode. And then they can also connect to each other. So you'll see these um, nanowires in, in the biofilm connecting to each other, and they're communicating through electrons, uh, which is, to me is, I always think of like Avatar, if you guys have seen that movie, where they like connect to the tree kind of thing, and they're kind of connected and, and talking to each other. And they could, I don't put a photo up here, but, they can also uh, use mediators, so they can send out extra uh, cellular um, mediators that will transfer electrons to, to be re reduced on the, the electrode. So we call it an MXC, it's kind of the basic term, and we've been playing around, it's just like biochar, um, it's a pretty new technology, we're playing around with what we call it because all the time new, new um, platforms are coming up 
uh, new uses for this technology. And you know, microbial fuel cell is mostly for, for electricity production. We also have mic microbial electrolysis cells. So that's where you actually add a little bit of energy into the system and you can facilitate different uh, chemical production like uh, uh, hydrogen is the big one, um, struvite, methane, all those kind of, if you're trying to increase this chemical production or enhance it, you can, you know, kind of use that process. And there's also uh, remediation cells, so you can, you can essentially bury electrodes into, say, sediment, and it's all based on this idea of, of the redox reaction, right? Electron acceptor and electron donor, and by hooking up um, these systems, you can enhance that process, because in general, anaerobes are kind of slow working uh, microbes, they have limited electron acceptors, and by kind of connecting them with uh, oxygen is the kind of the final terminal electron acceptor, you can enhance this process and you can break down all kinds of different uh, pollutants in the environment. So the, I believe that the, the biggest application for this system is going to be wastewater treatment. And that's where you see a lot of the research going now because our basic wastewater treatment system uses this um, you know, oxygen as an electron acceptor, um, aeration basins if you guys are familiar with it. And we can, we can facilitate that same reaction without needing to bubble air, without needing to aerate the water. So we can have similar um, wastewater treatment efficiency with actual positive energy production. Uh, so that's, that's a huge benefit. Another thing we do in our lab is desalinization. So you can create this by this potential gradient. Um, you can actually drive um, ions. You can separate them based on their charge to the electrode and actually desalinate water while you're treating uh, wastewater in, in the same process. That's really fascinating um, and I think has a lot of potential. And the remediation, like I said, um, chemical production, you can you, you basically produce chemicals uh, by treating wastewater and using that extra power to facilitate reactions. And then these remote power sources. So that's some of the stuff I do with the Navy is they're interested in throwing these systems out into the ocean and they can basically run indefinitely out, out of organic matter in, in the, uh, the seawater and they can run sensors. Uh, so we've been doing that for a little while and they actually have some deployed systems. So, like I said, you know, exponential growth, you're seeing this in similar stuff with uh, microbial fuel cells, with the publications are continuing to rise. More and more, actually, not necessarily energy production, but applying this, this phenomenon to different, uh, different desired uh, mechanisms. And then you see a little bit of rise in, continued rise in power production. Now, it's, I'll admit to you guys, when we're talking milliwatts here, per meter squared, it's not that much. I mean, when this technology first came out, they thought, oh, we're going to power cities out of wastewater treatment plants. And, um, and that's slowly but surely we're coming to realizing that there's some challenges with that. Scaling up is a challenge. Resistance scales with the size of the reactor, and so you have about the same power production even if you get bigger. Now, that's not to say that that's going to uh, go on indefinitely. I think with more research, um, we're, we could fix that. Theoretically, we should be able to get a lot more energy than that. Uh, it's just it's more of an engineering challenge at this point that should be able to be overcome. So there's a lot of different reactor types. You know, I showed you that basic uh, cartoon. You can really rearrange that in any way you could think of. And there's, and there's a ton of different ways. These are the more common reactors. Uh, these block reactors that we use for research is really effective. Uh, plate reactors, the tubular ones. Uh, you see this a lot for like developing countries. You can just stick it in a bucket. You have the cathode floating on top, and you have the anode sunk to the bottom, and that create, you can actually you know, clean water and generate a little electricity. There's these fun ones here with the plants. Uh, it's kind of a newer thing, and then you actually these little robot. They actually got this robot can like crawl over to the water. It'll suck up some water and power itself and be able to move around a little bit, and then suck up some more like river water with organic matter. Um, and then these these little uh, sediment fuel cells too. This is like what the Navy uses to, to power uh, sensors. So there's all kinds of different configurations. It just depends on what your application is. But the biggest problem with all of these is the cost. Um, and the, out, of the, out of all the material costs, the electrodes are the, the, the most expensive one. Um, and most of that's due to the cathode side, uh, oxygen reduction reaction. A lot of times you use a catalyst. Um, but in general, the, the, the electrodes are pretty expensive. Membranes are the second, but that depends if you don't even necessarily have to use a membrane or not. Uh, and then operation is actually really cheap. Um, once you get it up and running, it basically you know runs without any without any cost. So the, the step was to you know address these electrodes. So in general, um, electrodes using these systems are um, carbon-based, high surface area. Of course, they have to be conductive. 
Uh, biocompatible means so you don't you know leach metals and kill the bacteria. It needs to be friendly to bacteria and then stable. We want these things to last a long time so they need to be stable. And the new kind of concept, in my opinion, is they also need to be low cost, as we talked before, but also low impact. Most of these carbon substances are made from uh, uh, petroleum derived or coal derived. Um, and then what happens at the end of use? Uh, for the most part, they just get disposed of. And so is there a way we can upcycle this? So the, you know, that brought me to this idea of biochar. Biochar is um, you know, carbon based. Uh, I won't go too into much of this. Obviously, you guys are well um, educated in this subject. But it's very stable, um, similar to activated carbon, which we use. And then it, and it can also be used as agricultural mimic. But not normally associated with electrodes. Um, but there has been a lot of work on these bioelectrodes. Uh, back since, I think in the early 90s, they were working with you know, creating electrode material out of biomass. And you find that with you know, current research, uh, and then in the past, when you, when you heat this biomass, you know, this is the original biomass structure, as you heat it, it becomes more like graphite. So you burn off these uh, functional groups, uh, and you get this you know, more similar, very similar to what you would see in graphite. So that's really what brought me to the idea of it was you know, pretty simple connecting these two is thinking, well, you know, what if we can find the, the philosophies and the principles of biochar being you know, more sustainable, using waste biomass, um, Exo, uh, exothermic manufacturing process, and we, and we combined it with this idea of you know, bioelectrodes. And in, in, in the theory was we could come up with a, a lower cost um, and lower impact electrode with you know, much better LCA, full you know, life cycle assessment that has a lot better impact, or a lot less of an impact. So the next step was let's try making some of these stuff. Um, and we use, I work with Josh here, and we built this, um, this T-LUD right here. And we use mostly pine chip and pine pellets. We're from Colorado, so that's a, a largely available waste biomass material. Um, and it was a 35 gallon T-LUD with, I did have an external fan. So I treated it about HHT of, a, of at least 1,000 degrees C, if not higher. Um, it was about 60 minutes and about 12 C per minute. So as you can see here, you know, it took a little while, then you just see it spike up. And once I saw it go about to 8, 850, that's about the, the max you can get the material itself, just the chemical energy and the material, um, the heat generated during that process. Uh, that's about the highest temperature you can get. But if you kick the fan on right here, you can see you can bump it up to about 1,000 degrees C. So you don't even need the fan going all the time. You can let it get up and, uh, and then kick the fan on, and it stays around 1,000 degrees C, and then once I would let it go for just about 10 minutes, and then I would, I would wet quench it, so I'd, I'd pour water on it. Now, I'm going to run this by you guys, a little crowdsourcing here. I know we got a lot of names for, for a biochar, and I was going to see, you know, what do you guys think of electrochar as, as this material? I'll yeah. let you guys mill on it, and after this presentation, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we got a hand in the back. I, I thought there would be a few, a few acceptors. All right, so what we came up with is mostly carbon-based, as, as we would think, you know, for most of the literature burns off most of the lay bio um, fraction of the biomass, and you're gonna get mostly carbon. Uh, you know, some other, some other minerals um, and elements, but for the most part, we have a highly um, uh, high carbon-based uh, material. So once I got that, I wanted to compare against traditional uh, electrode materials. So I took my biochar samples using uh, the pine chip, uh, like sawdust pellets, and, um, and then just the chip, so just plain chip. And again, this was an, this is an attempt to make it as cheap as possible. And then I uh, compared it against activated carbon and graphite granules, and I threw it in this normal um, kind of lab scale microbial fuel cell battery type uh, arrangement, and then compared different parameters. The first step I want to do is a material characterization. I want to see how does this material, just as a material, look, and, um, and what are the characteristics similar to, to activated carbon. And I, I, love, I love these photos. Um, you can see that this is at, uh, they're all at 20 uh, micrometers, SEM photos. And this is the, the sawdust pellet. And you can see you have some of these micro pores, but then you have a lot of these larger, larger macro pores that are forming. And then this one, you know, the pine chip, I really like, one, it's a, it's a beautiful photo because it's so graphitic. At such that, that high temperature becomes mostly graphite and you get these nice photos. But you can see you have like, it's still the parent structure, the xylem, the phloem, and the cell walls. And then you have granular activated carbon. And this was, I believe, from coconut husk, and so it's mostly these macro or micro pores, um, and you don't have a lot of the a lot of the topography. 
So using BET, uh, I was able to kind of get a, a general um, idea of what, how much surface area. Obviously, this you know coconut activated carbon is really high surface area. Graphite, you know, there's almost no surface area whatsoever. And then these charts were pretty decent, um, with uh, you know about the same um, average pore diameter, uh, with and with the with the pellets being a little bit higher. And as you can see from those photos, you know those larger uh, cavernous uh, formations uh, occurred. But most of with the, with the activated carbon, and this will come in a little bit later, is, is these micropores, right? And then so here with the, the two biochar ones, uh, we have the more uh, getting into the maybe mesopores uh, range down there. So it's a little bit different pore structure. So the next thing that's really important with electrodes obviously needs to be um, conductive. So doing just using uh, conductivity measure, measurements, I could see that I could get it much more conductive than the activated carbon, not quite as conductive as graphite, which makes sense. Um, but the difference between these two really is, I think, is the parent structure itself. So as you can see from the chip, you still have it all this continuous morphology. We're all connected. So these graphitic zones that are forming in the, in the char are all connected together and it's going to decrease the, the resistance where your, where your pellets you know, are kind of broken apart and then re-conglomerated and, and carbonized. So you're not going to have a continue, continuous unabated flow, flow of electrons. And when you do XRD, you can kind of get the, the crystallinity of the, of the structure. And this really shows that, um, so with the, the pine pellets and the pine chips, is you, with, the, with the pine chip, which was much more conductive, it should basically turned into graphite. And, it, and I don't have the comparison for graphite on here, but it would look very similar to this. And so it basically, you know, turn it into graphite, but with this large uh, pore size distribution. So when we put it into the reactor, we would use, uh, at this time, we just use acetate, which is an easy uh, kind of com uh, comparison uh, medium, uh, feedstock medium for the microbes to, to degrade and produce electricity. What we found is that the biochar samples didn't produce as much electricity as the two, the two other samples, uh, but pretty close. Pretty close, and again, we're we're working at mill, milliwatts scale here, um, but it still shows, you know, that we're able to. They, they were effective. They were biocompatible. Um, they performed pretty well. Uh, there was just a little bit of a difference here, and most of that is the due to this string here. And I won't go too into depth, but it's a it's a it's an electrochemical measurement that we can see the resistance in the reactor, and what we can see is that the basically what the, the total resistance is from where it crosses the x-axis to this last part here and that's the total resistance and that really dictates how well it's going to perform in the reactor and because I didn't pre-treat or post-treat the, the granule or the biochar like didn't sieve it down to more uh, smaller size I couldn't pack as much of the electrode into the into the reactor as I could with the activated carbon uh, and the graphite and so that I, you know, I don't know if you, if you guys do research or not, it's always like when you get done with the experiment, you're like, oh, I wish I would have, you know, I wish I would have thought of that and changed it. And that's what I would have done. But I wanted, it was really the price point um, that I wanted to get at here, is mm -hmm. can you make these electrodes without doing any added manufacturing to really get the price down? That way it'd be so cheap, you know, we could just, we could put these systems up wherever. And that's where I, where I you know, I came through is the real takeaway here, is through this manufacturing process, you know, and these are actually pretty conservative measurements, I would say, for, uh, for activated carbon and graphite. You know, I would say that's definitely lower and maybe a little bit too high, but an average, uh, maybe it averages out to about the right price. Um, but at the end, the take home is, you know, these were much cheaper, and when you compare it, even though it had a slightly different, um, you know, power production, you know, it was orders, orders of magnitude cheaper. And so that's a big step for this technology. Is once we get it cheap enough, we can, you know, we can start deploying these things in more areas and, and it becomes more of a, a feasible technology. And then, you know, the, the next idea was, well, you know, you can't really call it biochar like, unless you use it as a soil amendment, right? But here on what, the potential of treating wastewater, there's tons of nutrients in there. And so can we extract nutrients and, and have a nice, thick, healthy biofilm on there? And then when we're done or when it's exhausted, can we then throw it away, uh, essentially, and, or resell it into to the agro ecosystem, and that's really something that hasn't been hasn't been explored yet. That I hope to hope to uh, look into next. So in general, um, you know, I, this this is geared towards microbial fuel cells. But I think this techno this procedure can help all of you, uh, whether it's in research or understanding char a little bit more. It really works as a kind of a, a great model of 
how chars, um, you know, using different temperatures, uh, what characteristics do you get out of it? Are they biocompatible? Because when you're going to put it in the soil, you're going to start interacting with microbes. Um, and I think there's a lot of different research we could do with this system to see, you know, how are these absorbent mechanisms, how are they affected by biofilm growth? Uh, are the microbes able to break down the char? How recalcitrant is it? So it may seem like kind of an off topic, but I feel like, you know, if any of you guys are interested, let me know and we can, we can explore this mechanism and see, you know, kind of how that relates to, to biochar in general and how, and, and how that would affect it in the field. So the takeaways are really that, you know, high temperature chars, we can get, you know, high surface area, it start, starts to become conduct, conductive, similar to what you would find in graphite and activated carbon, but a much lower cost. And then there's, you know, maybe some potential there for, for application after use. And like I told you before, you know, surface area density matters. Um, it, there may be a trade-off between conductivity, and so really there's, there's kind of this post-treatment that needs to happen if, if we want to use this, you know, uh, process for microbial fuel cells. And so I think there's going to have to be a little bit more research there. Is what's the optimal size and, you know, what is, how does post-treatment affect, um, uh, affect performance? But so I guess, you know, these results were good. It's in review, you know, it should be published. It's great for the, for the research community, community. But I'm guessing a lot of you are asking like, you know, what the heck can we use this for? Like, this sounds all good, but, <laughs> you know? Can we put it to work, right? We're, we're all trying to, you know, do good things here. So what are we gonna do next? And that's where I, I built a new reactor. I used biochar as the absorbent material uh, and the, as the electrode and I got municipal wastewater in Denver, and I ran an experiment. I ran versus aeration. Now aeration is kind of the gold standard for, um, for wastewater treatment. It's hard to beat because it's really effective. Uh, it's really effective, but it's really energy intensive, but for the most part, it works the best, and that's why all the wastewater treatment plants in the US and in the world use aeration. So if you can beat that, you're doing good. Um, and, that's, and that's what I found. So I'm using biochar here, which is the, the green line, and then versus aeration using the same wastewater. Now this is, for the most part, this is really high concentration COD and I got it from, uh, it's a mix between a municipal and actually a brewery and treated the wastewater. And what we found is we have a significantly faster reduction with the biochar. Um, and we have a significantly less sludge production here too. So it's actually a higher sludge removal is what this graph will show here. And that's because aeration in general is this, um, like the microbes are floating around and they become flocculent and they become like sludge, right? Because they're just floating around in the wastewater. Where with, with this fixed film process, the, the, uh, the biofilm is actually attached to the, to the electrode or to the, um, to the biochar and doesn't, it doesn't uh, like float around and slough off. And because you can actually feed it electrons from the inside where it's attached, it doesn't grow out like other fixed film processes and slough. So this is really a promising result and we wanted to experiment a little bit more with it. Um, before I go any further, though, I wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of idea of the, the mechanisms that are going on in here, because we not only have adsorption with the char itself, we have bioabsorption, so that the, the microbes themselves will then um, absorb materials, and then they'll also degrade it. So it's this great process of being able to adsorb pollutants and co-localize them with the bacteria that can then degrade it. Um, and then we also have this other phenomenon with microbial fuel cells, it's electrode deposition. And so because we have these potential gradients, we're going to absorb um, we're actually going to electrically absorb pollutants as well, especially um, ions. So, but I wanted to see what is, you know, how does this, is, was biochar, did I use a good um, uh, material or how does, how does the materials affect? Or can I just use activated carbon? How is it going to compare to activated carbon? So I used uh, the wood chip again, the pellets, activated carbon, and I treated uh, wastewater again. And what I found is that the chip itself actually reduced um, this is just based on COD reduction. I guess I should have went into that a little bit. That's just chemical oxygen demand. It's a very basic parameter for wastewater treatment. Um, that's how the EPA regulates effluent quality is based on COD. And it's just the amount of oxygen required to break down whatever's in your wastewater. So what we find is when we run it through these reactors is that the biochar examples or uh, samples, the materials work significantly better than the activated carbon. And I'm guessing, again, I threw these slides in. It's not a complete story, uh, but I thought you guys would be interested in, you know, the kind of these adsorbent mechanisms and using them for remediation. So I, so I threw it in there. Um, 
And the hypothesis is because the pore size distribution is just much bigger than activated carbon. For the most part, activated carbon has been used for you know, gas phase or for a specific um, pollutant, target pollutant, where the photos I showed you, you know, biochar has a much larger pore size and a much uh, wider pore size distribution. I think that helps it absorb organic molecules much more effectively and then you know, it also facilitates biofilm growth. So it's that combination that really is effective um, in this treatment process. I did a little bit exam, like, so how much was to do with the biofilm and how much was it to do with the absorption process? And I compared it, you know, again, aeration we always use because it's like a baseline. If I was just to show you these graphs, you wouldn't know basically how, how good it was. But it's, again, significantly faster. Um, and then this is with the, the pine pellets and then this is with a pine pellet with the biofilm on it. And so you can see that, you know, the absorption has a lot to do with water treatment, the wastewater treatment, but then the biofilm itself does, you know, kind of kicks it up a notch. And I think if we were to run this, and we are running this over a long time period, you'll have, if it was just absorption, it would fill up. But we, with the biofilm, it was that co-localization I was telling you about. So it absorbs it, and then the bacteria kind of regenerates the char. And it, it, in some of the literature you've, I've seen, this may go on indefinitely, or at least for a long time. So it's a really effective process. And, I, and like, I, so this, this graph here kind of shows that over time, we only did this a few trials, but uh, this is the first run, and then the second run, it just keeps getting better and better. And that's because this biofilm is building up, uh, becoming more complex, more dynamic, uh, and, and regenerating the char, and so it actually just keeps getting better. And again, this sludge production. So we did some more, another sludge production analysis with this experiment. And again, we have uh, significantly less sludge than the, than the wastewater here. It's the raw wastewater, the amount of uh, TSS, total suspended solids. And we can reduce a lot of the total suspended solids again because that's that absorption process. And because of the larger pore size, it can absorb larger molecules. Now through this one in there too, I thought you guys might be interested in, um, after I treated the water, about 12 gallons of it or so, and I did a few of these trials. I ran it through ICPMS. So this tells me what cations are, are actually absorbed onto the char itself. And what I find is all kinds of metals came out of there, all kinds of cations. Um, and that's why, in a way, I'm not supposed to say where I got the water because we found a lot of, kind of nasty <laughs> stuff in there. Um, so, you know, boron, sodium, uh, a ton of magnesium, uh, a ton of phosphorus, which was really promising and iron, copper, I actually scaled this out. And if we were to treat this on, and these are arbitrary numbers, but if we were to scale it out to the size of Denver's wastewater treatment plant, which is about 150 million gallons per day, it'd be around $65,000 a day in metals that we're able to absorb. And, you know, and that's, that's not counting actually getting the metals off the char and maybe some um, you know, uh, labor and that sort of stuff, but still it shows you there's a ton in there. And biochar works really well at these low concentrations. So I'm guessing there's not a ton of metal in this wastewater. It's just really effective at absorbing it all. And so I'd like to uh, say that again. Say it again. Um, well, so I, I mean, this is municipal wastewater from a brewery. So there's not, you wouldn't think there'd be a lot of metals in the wastewater. So there's a, it's a very low concentrations, and that's why you don't see a lot of effort to try to take the metals out. But because it's really effective at this process, it's I, I would guess, and I would. The next step is to, to measure before and after, but I'm guessing it's just taking it all out, taking all the metals out. How much uh, water was, is this representing? So it was 12 gallons total, and the next thing oh. here is actually uh, micrograms per gallon. And you can see, like on some of this stuff, like the magnesium uh, and the iron and the phosphorus, we're getting up to like, you know, over 100 milligrams per gallon that's uh, absorbed out of, the, out of the wastewater stream. So I, I gotta imagine it's, it's close to 90% you know, removal rate. And again, that's, I'm kind of just throwing that out there, but I'm guessing there's not that much in the water or else they would be in really big trouble. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, did you do the metal analysis of your chart beforehand too? I did, so this is, yeah, I did. So this is actual okay. gain. Okay. This is, yeah. Yes, uh, did you exchange this this is absorbed on the bar chart, mm -hmm. so you have to exchange the exchanges and get it into the solution mm -hmm. before you went to ICP. Yeah. Why? What did you exchange that with? Hydrochloric acid. What's the uh, concentration? It really low. Really low concentration. 0.01 M? I don't know. I actually didn't do it. 
Uh, we sent, I sent it out, there's a lab on campus, uh, but supposedly it's, it, it's not that hard. It's really easy to elude these off of the jar. You can just wash it with a low concentration of acid and it, and it, it all comes off. This sewer comes from an industrialized district or just no. residential? No. Okay. I wish I could tell you guys where it came from. You'd be pretty surprised. But no, I mean, this is just a municipal small town in Colorado. Perhaps we shouldn't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't know who's here. Be careful. <laughs> well, I, you might be able to put it together. A small town with a big brewery. There are two Rocky Mountain Fresh. There are two. She's alright. That's it? Okay. I've got one with nothing. That's fine. Um, and then I thought this one was interesting too. So this was actually what leached off of the char. And I heard a lot of people ask that. Um, I heard a lot of people ask that in the past too is, you know, what, what leaches off? And, and so in a wastewater stream, which is pretty, um, you know, harsh environment, most of, almost all of my their aluminum that was present in the, in the char itself leached off. You know, there's some potassium that was in what was in the char. It leached off mostly in the zinc and, and radium. But other than that, they um, it, it didn't. These these were the, the the cations that leached, and you know maybe that would be an issue if we scale these reactors up and we have a large uh, volume of, of char. This might add to you know this might add more metals to the water. Maybe an issue, but something to something to investigate. Do you have data for boron, by the way? There. Uh there's boron on this one. Yes. yes. Yeah. So there is rubidium in the pine. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, and these are pro these are really small. So this is on a log scale. So I should have told you that this is on a log scale. Um, so I mean these are really low concentrations. But yeah. I I just have one question. Mm -hmm. So you have micrograms per milligram mm -hmm. instead of the unit and a thousand milligrams of potassium or a thousand micrograms of potassium per milligram. So. It's saying that it's all potassium. Yeah, it, it lost the. Um, is that per gallon? Yeah, this was per gallon. gallon. Okay, so the, that's okay. Micrograms per liter. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And again, I threw these. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that was my question. Just okay. Okay. So the other, the other um, kind of uh, study that I would love to investigate is this uh, using SEM and EDS. So this is another photo of the char after it was uh, after it was treated. And, I, and it shows a little bit different. So basically you can take a photo of it and then you can map it with this EDS um, mechanism and it'll just basically balance, I think, x-rays off of the surface and then measuring it'll tell you what elements are present on the surface itself. Um, so this is on based on weight percentage, but you can see again, magnesium, uh, silicon, phosphorus, calcium, a lot of chromium, which is you know carcinogen and, and molybdenum. Uh, I would love to, the next step will be be able to take the a photo of the char beforehand and then take the exact same photo and see, map it, see kind of what elements are present on the surface and then take a photo again and see kind of where it deposits. Because you can see that the, the metals and cations deposit really in different areas on the char surface. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be kind of the next step to, um, to investigate. So in general, you know, with the electrodes, we need to improve the manufacturing process to get it up there where activated carbon and graphite is, which I think is possible, um, you know, to increase the power density and, and uh, energy harvesting. And then develop methods, actually, if we do this in wastewater treatment, to de develop a way we actually extract and recover those resources and investigate, you know, we don't, I don't, I didn't really show you many mechanisms. We have this general idea how it might be happening and it works, but how is it exactly, exactly happening? It's because the biofilm is, is it the material or is it because of this electro deposition? We don't know yet. Uh, and then investigate, you know, depending on what source you get it, you may not want to put those, if there's metals in the wastewater, we're not going to, obviously we're not going to want to land apply that. But maybe in different waste streams, we can use this process and get just nutrients and be able to, be able to land, land apply it. So this is not the end. There's obviously <laughs> a lot more research uh, to be done, but I think it's, it has some potential. It's a pretty kind of unique process of water treatment, and um, I look forward to, to continuing the investigating it. Very exciting research. Any questions? Yes, Kelpie. Can people stand for the yes, questions? Please. Thank you. Um, about greenhouse gas emissions from the process of respiration of these microbes. Yeah. So we looked at that and yeah, compared and it to standard wastewater treatment? Well, the advantage with this, I mean, when it comes to methane, so the 
in the anaerobic environment where you're going to see methane production, it actually competes with methanogens. So it'll outcompete methanogens in the most pro in, in, in most of the time. So you won't see any methane production, uh, but you will see CO2, C CO2 uh, emissions. But it's but again, this is I guess it would be carbon neutral, right? Because it's coming from um, uh, a biogenic carbon source. Why did you choose pine char? Oh, uh, well, one, you know, working with Josh, luckily I kind of got a step ahead of the game a little bit, kind of, um, and so I kind of knew that it had the parameters that I was looking for, and two, we just have a lot of, we have a lot of pine in Colorado, and we have a lot of beetle kill. If you're looking for density, you might look for a more lignin-rich material like a hardwood, uh, or even go to something like a nut where it is, you know, very highly lignin. You're right, you're right, yeah, definitely. And again, it was price. I was looking for, you know, is there anything locally available? This was, I tried to have this as a model of, you know, can you use a locally available source, hopefully with high lignin content, that you don't have to process, that comes in for free, and that was just kind of a, a good example locally. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, Tyler, when you were doing your, um, your coding of your, um, your char, did you notice that it was kind of patchier, that it sloughed off at times, or we, did you try backwashing it to clean it off to test effectiveness of it? Or so the biofilm you're saying? Yeah, the film. Yeah, did so the notice? again, like I like I mentioned with with a, the um, using it in like a we call it like a biologic or like using it in that MFC configuration. It really you can barely even see the biofilm. It's a really thin biofilm, and that's because, again, it's not growing out towards its carbon source like normal trickle, like trickling filters, right? You'll have this sloughing because it's growing out and it's competing, and then it'll slough off. But because you're giving it its carbon source from, it, from the, I guess, the substrate that it's, uh, that it's adhered to, it doesn't need to grow out like that. And so it really, there's, you know, there's hardly any sludge production like I was showing, and you, you can't really see it that well. You don't really, you know, you can kind of see there's like a slime on it, but it's not a real thick slime you would see in other processes. And you never backwashed it or tried backwashing it? You know, this was, this was more of a feasibility study. Did it work? What kind of stuff are we, and then hopefully we'll be able to, you know, use this data, apply for more money, scale up, and, and go from there. Yes. Uh, what kind of time scale Stand, are you passing on? What, uh, what kind of a time scale are you generating electricity and, um, out with the you know treated so many the COD water. reduction I mean, it was within I have a like I had a time bar you know the, the um, x-axis was time it really takes maybe similar to aeration but it's you know in this reactor the the hydraulic retention time was around uh, like 18 hours so it's it, it's pretty fast it was and as you saw it was faster than aeration which is you know it's about as fast as it gets other questions yes so um, you may have covered this when I had to step out, but does the um, length of time that it works correlate, or is it the same as activated carbon? Or does it, you know, like that? How how effective? Like it's over over time, will it start yeah. fouling? Yeah. I, I would think so. I mean, I think there's going to be a limit to it. I, we're continuing this experiment. This was just some real recent data, but I would I would assume theoretically, yeah, the, the pores are going to fill up. Uh, but again, it's that biofilm process, so it's the combination between physical absorption and biodegradation that really, I believe, makes this a, an effective treatment process because it's clearing out those pores. The bacteria are going in there and kind of eating up all the organic matter that are, that are absorbed onto there. So it should last for a long time. Any other questions? Uh, here I have a question. You may have mentioned this, but uh, this the latter part of your presentation uh, with the uh, municipal water, wastewater. Uh, did uh, you pack this bar chart into columns and past and all that? Mm -hmm. the, did you mention anything about the particle size of the bar chart when you packed it? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Did you mention that something? About I that? didn't. I didn't mention it, and I, you know, I really didn't show any like uh, you know, like I didn't show you the reactor itself. Uh, so with the chip, the chip are pretty big, and I know that's kind of. That's not really a technical term, big, but uh, they weren't. We're, I'm not talking about powders. Uh, these are these are granules, and that's really important because with wastewater, if it's just a powder, it's going to clog. So it needed to have enough porosity to actually allow the water to, to run over it. And then I used the pine pellets. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. You know, it's a, the pine pellet size, which is a little bit more packed. 
And I found that even though like with the, with the chip that had these larger gaps in between, mm -hmm. it still treated the, because I think of the pore sizes again, the pore sizes are a little bit bigger, it still was really effective, nearly as effective as the really packed bed. And, and do you have data on the surface area of your bar charts? It was the same stuff I used in the previous experiment. Mm -hmm. So it had the same surface area and pore size distribution. Questions? Kelpie again. I'm just curious how it would scale up and what it would look like to treat, you know, a million gallon or yeah. a yeah. day waste water treatment plant. Can you just describe what the component It would be similar to, you know, you take, well, have you seen a biological trickling filter or a nitrogen, a denitrifying trickling filter? No. They're big, just big <laughs> silos. They're big silos and they use them already and they just have these like, uh, almost like a sprinkler that just trickles water down over it. And so it, for a long time, we were using that could be carbon or we just used rocks in the past, you know, just using trickling filter rocks and just getting that biofilm growing over it. So this isn't a system that would be, you know, unfeasible. I mean, we've seen similar stuff, but because of the price of activated carbon, they've kind of been phased out. And you see it coming back. Uh, um, uh, uh, Sweden is saying they're starting to pass some regulations now that's saying they want like tertiary treatment in their wastewater with using activated carbon. So I think that's kind of the trend because it is really effective and it's really effective at micro pollutants. But with this system, you wouldn't be harvesting electricity. Yeah, that'd be the goal. I mean, I think so there's a lot more engineering, more technical engineering that would go into that. Um, but at least it would, you could, I mean, you can use the electricity for a variety of things. Maybe you're trying to, because manipulating the biofilm is one thing that you can do with the current. Um, and then maybe it's, uh, uh, you could also produce peroxide towards the end. You can use that current to facilitate like the Fenton reaction and produce peroxide that could then uh, disinfect the water. So I don't think it would be to power maybe the whole system, like the whole like a city next to it. Maybe power the pumps and then maybe um, maybe facilitate some re desirable reaction. Yes. I pointed out that there are a number of different types of microbial cells. Um, would this be applicable to those other types as well? Uh, you mean the, 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 like the second page I showed you with the different types of uh, right. bacteria? I would think that there's all the above in there. Uh, the wastewater has basically every type of bacteria you could imagine in it, and you're going to have a variety. It's, it's a very dynamic and diverse. Uh, bacteria, not for wastewater, but for other applications where they're using the microbial cells, where you can introduce the idea of the MXCs, various uh, types of cells. Uh, what do you mean, like reactor configurations, or? Right, in the electrolysis, the fuel cell, um, you mentioned fuel cell chemical. Oh, oh, would you see that, oh, this, this, that, this reactor type and those other types of cells? No, because a lot of those require membranes. Uh, and, you know, this, this is an attempt to be as cheap as possible. And so when you're trying to do any chemical, like, separation, you're going to need a membrane. Desalinization, you're going to need a membrane. Or a catalyst. Um, or a catalyst, yeah. So yeah, I doubt it. It's going to be mostly for wastewater treatment or remediation of polluted waters. Okay, let's give them a hand of applause. Great job.